Dan said Mount Fitcher Windmill has stood here for over 230 years. Throughout this time, it has had many owners and tenants, been used as a scout headquarters, and has undergone several restorations. Today, it is run and maintained by the Stansted Millers, a group that is dedicated to the preservation of the mill, who hold open days and events at the mill for the benefit of the residents of Stansted. Built in 1787 by Joseph Linzel, the mill stood in the woodland known as Conagree Wood. However, it was not long before Joseph had to raise a mortgage on the mill, and by 1807, the mill was put up for sale by auction. It was bought by J.G. Chaplin with the help of a mortgage from Robert Sorder, a sister from Hartford, who, followed by his son, would become involved in the mill for the next 60 years. When Mr. Chaplin died in 1844, he was behind on his mortgage payments, and so an attempt was made to sell the mill. But the reserve price was not met, and so it did not, leaving it in the hands of the Sorders. After many years struggling to make the mill profitable, they eventually managed to sell the mill at auction in 1867 to William White, who went on to sell it in 1887 to James Blythe, the man who would later become the first Baron Blythe of Stansted Mount Fitchett. From 1807 until 1910, the windmill was operated by many different tenants, each of whom tried in vain to make the mill pay, and the longest serving of these tenants was Edward Hicks. In 1850, he said in a letter, The mill has ground scarcely anything for the last month for want of wind, there is great loss of time often. A windmill is not worth much with the present trade. Basically, he is saying that the mill hasn't been making money over the past month as they couldn't produce enough flour due to a lack of wind. Ten years later, he even suggested installing a steam engine to power the machinery. However, this idea was turned down by the owner of the mill. It remained financially unsuccessful as it had been its whole working life and closed as a working mill in 1910. After carrying out extensive renovations in 1930, the second Lord Blythe conveyed the mill for the benefit of the inhabitants of Stansted in 1935. The parish council were appointed as trustees and in 1952 the mill was scheduled as an ancient monument and by then a windmill restoration committee had been formed with the predecessors to today's Stansted Millers. Ever since then, the trustees, in partnership with the Stansted Millers, have continued to preserve the mill, carrying out extensive repairs over the years, the most recent of which being in 2010. An ongoing programme of repair and maintenance goes on to this day. Sacks of grain were received on the ground floor and stored in the partitioned bays before being hoisted to the cap where the milling process began. The sack hoist brought grain from the ground floor to the cap, where it was emptied into the three bins below through trap doors in the floor. The cap also served another purpose as the engine room of the mill. Power was transferred from the sails to the upright shaft via the brake wheel and the wallower, while outside the fan ensures that the sails are always facing into the wind. As the fan turns, the worm moves the whole cap, which rolls on a steel-faced curb. On the dust floor, the grain awaiting milling was stored in three boarded bins. On this floor, you can also see the takeoff drives of the sack hoist and the refining machinery on the floor below. The stone floor is where the grain was turned into flour. Overhead, the drive from the upright shaft is transmitted to the great spur wheel, which, in turn, powers the cogs that correspond with each pair of stones. Then, square rods called quants connect the cogs to the stones, making the stones turn. Each pair of stones could be disengaged from the great spur wheel by knocking out the locking wedges set in the timber framework above that pair of stones. The stones are overdriven, which means that the upper stone, called the running stone, spins, whereas the lower one, known as the bed stone, stays in place. The stones, made of French burr, are encased in a vat which has a framework or horse mounted over it. The set of stones has been dismantled for exhibition purposes to show the nature of the millstones. Grain from the bins above is fed to the hopper by a sleeve. The bell attached to a strap inside the hopper acts as a warning to the miller should the hopper run dry. The miller can adjust how much grain is put into the stones using controls on the floor below, as well as by moving the wooden gate near the end of the shoe. After the grain is ground, it falls at the edge of the stones through a spout to the floor below. The miller was a highly skilled man, and from here, the control floor or mill room, he could control the workings of the mill. His job was to ensure the flour produced by the mill was of the finest quality. He would do this by sampling the flour coming down the chutes from the stones above. He would feel the flour between his fingers, and his experience would tell him the fineness or quality of the flour. The fineness depended on how far the stones were apart and how quickly the grain was moved from the hoppers into the stones. 
To ensure perfection, the miller will constantly be adjusting the distance between the stones by means of the T-shaped bars, and to control how quickly the grain went into the stones, he would adjust the incline of the spring tension shoe, which fed grain into the stones above. This was done by means of the crook strings wound round the twist pegs. Also involved in this process were the three governors, which could be adjusted to vary the distance between the stones depending on how fast the miller fed the grain into the stones. The flour from the shoots or spouts was bagged and then loaded onto carts through the black door. Stanstead Scouts occupied the mill between 1942 and 1963. After the mill was given to the village in 1935, it became damp with mildew, rot and woodworm setting in. The scouts cleaned the mill, controlled the woodworm and kept it weatherproof. They also kept the pigeon population that roosted in the cap under control by trapping them in the beams of their torches, causing the birds to freeze and allowing them to be captured and taken to a local pigeon fancier, which is someone who keeps pigeons as pets. Without the scouts, the windmill may well have deteriorated beyond prepair during that 21 year period. Today, the mill is run and maintained by a volunteer organisation known as the Stansted Millers, originally the Windmill Restoration Committee, which was formed in 1943. They hold open days and the windmill fate to raise money for the restoration work that must happen at the mill. The most recent of these restorations was in 2010, when the cap was repaired so that it could turn again. Um, the Stansted Millers were a group set up to do odd jobs, keep the mill running, get people to steward on open days and that sort of thing. So yeah, that's their main function. And most of them pay some membership money and that sort of thing to help keep us going. Windmill Fate is run by people who volunteer to man stores and we have lots of things going on and things for children and Teddy parachuting out the windows and all sorts of things, China smashing, that sort of thing. And everybody has to help, everyone has to give a hand and help set up the stalls, marquees, etc. But it is a big event for everybody. It's more like a village fete now than just the windmill. The Millers will continue to look after the mill and hold events for the benefit of the residents of Stansted.